Good afternoon. My name is John Gooden, and I am the director of EPA's Office of Wetlands, Oceans, and Watersheds. My role is to serve as the moderator for today's meeting. I want to thank you for your time and your interest in today's webcast on the final Navigable Waters Protection Rule. Last month, the EPA and the Department of the Army signed the Navigable Waters Protection Rule, revising the regulations defining waters of the United States and the scope of federal jurisdiction under the Clean Water Act. The rule provides a straightforward definition of waters of the United States that will protect the nation's navigable waters and provide increased regulatory certainty. The agencies are hosting this webcast to explain key elements of the final rule, including detailed information on the rule's provisions. This webcast is being recorded and will be hosted on the agency's website for later access. Before we begin, let me introduce Dr. Owen McDonough, Senior Science Advisor to the Assistant Administrator for EPA's Office of Water. Thanks, John, and thank you to the many people who have made an effort to join us today. When President Trump took office, he immediately began a process to remove and replace undue regulatory burdens that stifle American innovation and economic development, including his February 28, 2017, Executive Order 13778 on restoring the rule of law, federalism, and economic growth by reviewing the Waters of the United States rule. The EPA and the Department of the Army have implemented the President's ex Executive Order in two steps. In step one, the agencies repealed the 2015 WOTUS rule and recodified the regulations that were in place prior to the issuance of the 2015 rule. The step one rule became effective on December 23rd, 2019. Step two is the Navigable Waters Protection Rule. On January 23rd, 2020, the agencies finalized this revised definition of waters of the United States. At this point, the rule has been submitted to the Office of the Federal Register but is not yet published. The rule will become effective 60 days after it is published in the Federal Register. The agencies have streamlined the definition of waters of the United States to include four clear categories of jurisdictional waters, provide specific exclusions for many water features that have traditionally not been federally regulated, and to define terms in the regulatory text that have never been defined before. The final rule reflects legal precedent set by key Supreme Court cases, as well as robust public outreach and engagement, including significant pre-proposal input and over 620,000 comments received on the proposal. The Navigable Waters Protection Rule protects the environment while respecting states, localities, tribes, and private property owners. It clearly delineates where federal regulations apply and gives states and local authorities more flexibility to determine how best to manage waters within their borders. I'm pleased to note that EPA has worked side by side with our partners at the Department of the Army throughout the two-step rulemaking process. Thank you, Dr. McDonough. I'm now pleased to introduce Mr. Ryan Fisher, Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Army for Civil Works. Thanks, John. Appreciate it. And thanks to everybody for joining us today. Uh, my name is Ryan Fisher. I'm here on behalf of my boss, R.D. James, the Assistant Secretary of the Army for Civil Works. We here at the Department of Army, which is to include the Corps of Engineers, have worked closely with EPA on these rulemakings to help improve the clarity in defining what is and what is not jurisdictional under the Clean Water Act. In developing the Navigable Waters Protection Rule, we tried to bring a common sense approach to the definition which will make implementation more clear and predictable and at the same time reduce inconsistencies in implementation across the nation. This rule recognizes and respects the primary authority of states and tribes to have over their land and water resources and it balances the protection of federal waters with the need to support the nation's economic interests. Having a clear and understandable definition creates a more efficient process for the agencies to make jurisdictional determinations and thereby get predictable decisions on when permits are required to the public quicker, allowing for necessary economic growth to move forward. For Mr. James's tenure as Assistant Secretary of the Army for Civil Works, his goal is to improve the overall efficiency and consistencies within our regulatory program. This final rule certainly takes a large step in moving us towards that objective. Thank you again to everyone for, for joining us here today. Thank you, Mr. Fisher. I will now turn the meeting over to Ms. Mindy Eisenberg, Associate Director of the Oceans, Wetlands, and Communities Division, and Ms. Stacy Jensen, 
Assistant for Regulatory and Tribal Affairs for Army Civil Works to walk through the provisions of the final rule. Before we begin the presentation, I have a few housekeeping matters. Please note that audience questions or comments on the substance of the final rule will not be received or addressed during the course of this webcast in order to ensure we can cover all of the material. If you have any technical support related questions, please type them into the questions function in the gray sidebar on the right side of your screen under the orange circle. To access the technical support Q&A, hover your mouse under the orange circle and click where it says questions. Technical support staff will do their best to help you resolve any issues. If the organizers send a message to attendees via the chat feature, you can access the chat message by hovering your mouse further down on the gray sidebar and clicking on chat. To hide these features, just click on the questions or chat area of the gray sidebar and they will be minimized. For today's presentation, we will provide a background on Waters of the U.S., take a, look, a close look at the elements of the final rule, what waters are in and what are out, and some definitions of terms, and then we'll highlight some differences compared to the 2019 rule, which is how the agencies implemented the definition of Waters of the United States prior to the 2015 WOTUS rule. And then we'll highlight how the agencies will implement the final rule and some next steps. I also want to note that the pre-publication version of the final rule and preamble, uh, various fact sheets, and the supporting analyses for the final rule can be found on our agency websites. The preamble in particular provides an extensive discussion of the rationale for the final rule and includes important information on how the agencies will implement it. To provide some context for the final rule, Waters of the United States is a threshold term in the Clean Water Act and establishes the scope of federal jurisdiction under the Act. It applies to the many programs under the Act, including water quality standards, total maximum daily loads, oil spills, the National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System permits, and dredged and fill permits. Because the Clean Water Act does not further define Waters of the U.S., the EPA and the Army have defined it in regulations since the 1970s, and the definition has been subject to litigation over the years. As Owen noted, the EPA and the Army have responded to Executive Order 13778 in a two-step rulemaking process to provide for greater regulatory certainty as we develop the revised final definition of Waters U.S. The first step was completed in the fall of 2019, and it repealed the 2015 Waters U.S. rule defining uh, and recodified the prior regulations. That rule, which we refer to as the 2019 rule or the Step 1 rule, became effective nationwide on December 23, 2019. After carefully considering the many public comments on the proposed rule to revise the definition of Waters U.S., on January 23, 2020, the agency signed the final Navigable Waters Protection Rule definition of waters of the United States. This revised definition, which is the second step of our rulemaking process, establishes the scope of federal regulatory authority under the Clean Water Act. The agencies embarked on the effort to revise the definition of waters of the U.S. in March of 2017 with the goals of operating within the scope of the federal government's authority to regulate navigable waters under the Clean Water Act and under the U.S. Constitution. We are, we're aiming to restore and maintain the integrity of the nation's waters while preserving the traditional sovereignty of states and tribes over their land and water resources. And we were aiming to increase predictability and consistency through a clearer definition of waters of the United States. The agency's final rule codifies four categories of jurisdictional waters in both the EPA's and the Army Corps of Engineers regulations. The territorial seas and traditional navigable waters, which are referred to as A1 waters. Tributaries of these waters, which are referred to as A2 waters. 
lakes and ponds, and impoundments of jurisdictional waters, which are referred to as A3 waters, and finally, adjacent wetlands referred to as A4 waters. Waters and features not meeting the conditions of one of these categories are not waters of the United States. And Stacy will discuss later in the pre presentation the exclusions from the definition. I'll now highlight some key overall changes from the 2019 rule before I walk through each category of jurisdictional waters. The agencies have streamlined and clarified those waters that are waters of the United States and those that are not through four categories of jurisdictional waters and 12 categories of excluded waters and features. Many of the exclusions that the agencies have codified were highlighted in the preambles of the agency's 1980s regulations. And where that is the case, these waters are generally not found to be jurisdictional under the 2019 rule. By specifying these exclusions in regulation rather than in preamble, we see that it provides greater predictability and consistency. In the final rule, the agencies have combined into one category the territorial seas and traditional navigable waters, which were previously two separate categories. The final rule does not contain a standalone category of interstate waters. Waters crossing state boundaries must meet the conditions of one of the four categories of jurisdictional waters to be waters of the U.S. Unlike the 2019 rule as implemented, this final rule does not require the agencies to conduct a significant nexus analysis to determine the jurisdiction of certain waters and wetlands. Rather, we will assess the waters based on the conditions described in the four categories. And finally, the agencies have created a new category of standing water bodies by combining the historic category of impoundments with lakes and ponds as they function similarly on the landscape. For the territorial seas and traditional navigable waters category, the agencies have not made any changes to the def definition of traditional navigable water, or TNW, in the FAUNA rule, and have only combined these two types of waters for simplicity. These are foundational waters, such as the Great Lakes and the Mississippi River, and the federal government's authority to regulate them is grounded in the authority to regulate interstate commerce under the Commerce Clause of the Constitution. The following three categories of waters of the U.S. all tie back to these A1 waters for determining their status as waters of the U.S. And you'll hear me, hear me refer back to contributing surface water flow to TNWs and the territorial seas in the coming categories. The second category of jurisdictional waters is tributaries. And the definition is on this slide, which I won't read to you. I do want to highlight some key aspects of the tributary definition. In order to be considered a tributary and therefore jurisdictional under the Clean Water Act, rivers and streams and other natural channels must first be intermittent or perennial in a typical year. They also must contribute surface water flow to a downstream TNW or territorial sea in a typical year. They can also flow through other categories of jurisdictional waters, like lakes, before reaching a TNW or territorial sea. Perennial and intermittent waters are jurisdictional if they are upstream of a channelized, non-jurisdictional surface water, so long as they contribute surface water flow to a downstream jurisdictional water in a typical year. The use of channelized in this context generally indicates features with a defined path or course, such as a non-jurisdictional ditch or the bed of an ephemeral stream. The flow must be discrete and confined to a channel as opposed to diffuse. Although these channelized non-jurisdictional features may provide that surface water connection between the upstream and downstream jurisdictional waters, rather than severing the jurisdiction of the upstream tributary, they aren't jurisdictional themselves. The agencies have identified other situations where an upstream intermittent or perennial tributary does not lose its jurisdictional status. This can occur where it flows through artificial features like culverts or tunnels or dams. It can also occur through natural features like a boulder field, or debris pile, or certain subterranean rivers where the largely same water daylight 
and then carries on downstream to a jurisdictional water. The agency's longstanding interpretation of the Clean Water Act is that tributaries that are altered or relocated are jurisdictional, and the agencies are not changing this interpretation so long as it still meets the flow conditions of the tributary definition. Altering or relocating a tributary means changing its shape or modifying its path, for example, by straightening a winding river, adding material to stabilize banks, adding features to reduce how fast the water moves, or moving an entire portion of the tributary to another channel. A relocated tributary is one in which an entire portion of the tributary is moved to a different location, as when a tributary is rerouted around a city center to protect it from flooding, or around a mining complex to enable extraction of commercially viable uh, minerals. The tributary definition includes a ditch that either relocates a tributary, is constructed in a tributary, or is constructed in an adjacent wetland, as long as the ditch satisfies the flow conditions of this definition. And I'll come back to ditches shortly. I also mentioned the term typical year in the definition of tributary. This is an important concept for distinguishing tributaries under the final rule as well as the other categories of waters in the United States, and I'll come back to that a little later in the presentation. As I mentioned before, the final rule does not require a significant nexus analysis to determine jurisdiction, which is different from how the agencies are implementing the 2019 rule. This analysis, as called for under Justice Kennedy's opinion in the Rapanos Supreme Court case, requires the agencies to prove that the water or wetland in question has significant physical, chemical, and biological effects on other covered waters more readily understood as navigable. Ephemeral streams are not jurisdictional under the final rule, a contrast to the 2019 rule and pre-2015 rule practice, where some ephemeral streams have been found jurisdictional following a significant nexus analysis. And finally, the agencies have long used the ordinary high water mark to establish the lateral limits of a tributary, and the Army Corps of Engineers' longstanding regulatory definition is retained and codified in EPA's regulations. However, it is not in the definition of tributary. The final rule contains 16 definitions of key terms used. Several of these are particularly relevant to understanding the definition of tributary. To provide clarity, the agencies have defined perennial, intermittent, and ephemeral. The use of the term indirect response to precipitation in the definition of intermittent and ephemeral in the final rule is intended to help distinguish between surface water flow solely caused by individual precipitation events, including multiple individual back-to-back -back storms, and continuous flow resulting, for example, from weeks or months long accumulation of precipitation in the form of snowpack that melts slowly over time, or an elevated groundwater table that provides base flow to the channel bed. The agencies are also clarifying the difference between snowpack melt and snowfall to distinguish between intermittent and ephemeral waters. Snowpack means layers of snow that accumulate over extended periods of time in certain geographic regions or at high elevation. To clarify, the final rule does not mandate groundwater input as part of the definition of perennial or intermittent, which the agencies determined would too narrowly limit Clean Water Act jurisdiction over waters that provide sufficient surface water flow to traditional navigable waters in a typical year. For example, perennial or intermittent flow in certain mountain streams may We apologize for our technical difficulties. We have, uh, uh, hopefully the folks can hear us. So moving on uh, for our, our third category, lakes and ponds and impoundments of jurisdictional waters. The agencies have created this separate jurisdictional category for standing bodies of open waters that are not themselves traditional navigable waters. 
I, w I won't repeat the uh, definition that is on your slide. This lakes, ponds, and impoundments category is similar to the tributaries category. Lakes and ponds and impoundments of jurisdictional waters must contribute surface water flow to a traditional navigable water or territorial sea in a typical year. Lakes, ponds, and impoundments are jurisdictional if they are upstream of a channelized non-jurisdictional feature, such as an ephemeral stream or non-jurisdictional ditch, or certain other excluded waters as long as they contribute surface water flow to a downstream jurisdictional water in a typical year. In addition, lakes, ponds, and impoundments of jurisdictional waters are, the, are jurisdictional if they contribute surface water flow through artificial features or through certain natural features to a downstream jurisdictional water in a typical year. A contribution of surface water flow may occur through pumps uh, or over, through or over a levee, floodgates, reservoir releases or other mechanisms, and the agencies do not distinguish between natural and artificially manipulated surface water flow that connects a lake pond or impoundment with another water theta in that typical year. The key is that they contribute surface water flow to a jurisdictional water in a typical year. I also want to point out that a lake pond or impoundment of a jurisdictional water may also be found to be jurisdictional under the final rule where it is inundated by flooding from a jurisdictional water. This scenario may occur, for example, with certain oxbow lakes. The agencies do not mandate in the final rule text the frequency, duration, or volume of the inundation, recognizing the variation across the country, just that it occurs in a typical year as opposed to flooding that occurs only on a 50 or 100 year basis, for example. The agencies are treating certain lakes and ponds as part of the tributary network. However, we are providing greater clarity about the types of surface water connections that can establish jurisdiction, whether it is flooding by inundation from a jurisdictional water or through artificial connections to jurisdictional waters like pumping or, or reservoir releases that contribute surface flow to a downstream TNW in a typical year. We, with the exception of impoundments that are traditional navigable waters themselves, while both the final rule and the 2019 rule require jurisdictional impoundments to first be impounding other waters of the U.S., such as damming a perennial river, the final rule also requires that for an impoundment to be jurisdictional, it has to contribute surface water flow to a TNW or territorial sea in a typical year and if that impoundment doesn't, it won't be jurisdictional unless they're inundated by flooding of an otherwise jurisdictional water. Our fourth category of waters of the U.S. is adjacent wetlands. The test for establishing jurisdiction over wetlands differs from tributaries and lakes, ponds, and impoundments. Wetlands derive their jurisdictional status from their surface water connection to an otherwise jurisdictional water. And consistent with the 1980s regulations, an adjacent wetland cannot make another wetland jurisdictional. There are four ways a wetland can be found jurisdictional under the final rule as presented on this slide. There are several key elements of the definition of adjacent wetlands to note. A wetland can be considered a budding and therefore adjacent to a tributary or other jurisdictional water, even where the channel of the river or stream, for example, is incised, such that the wetland is perched above it. Similar to the category of lakes, ponds, and impoundments, if there's inundation by flooding from a jurisdictional water to the wetland in a typical year, jurisdiction can be established over that wetland. However, flooding from the wetland to the jurisdictional water does not establish efficiency. The agencies recognize some wetlands in the floodplains of rivers will be flooded in a typical year and they will likely be considered adjacent. However, just because a wetland is in a 100-year floodplain doesn't mean it will necessarily be jurisdictional. The inundation of the wetland by flooding from the jurisdictional water has to occur in a typical year. <clears throat> 
The agencies are also clarifying that natural berms, dunes, and similar natural features that separate a wetland from a, an otherwise jurisdictional water are indicative of the wetland being inseparably bound up with or part of that jurisdictional water. By allowing this to establish adjacency, the agencies are recognizing such features as evidence of a dynamic and regular direct hydrologic surface connection between such waters and the wetlands. In the fourth condition for establishing adjacency, as well as with the other categories of waters, the agencies recognize that there is, a, is significant human modification of our water systems and that a direct hydrologic surface connection can occur through artificial features and not sever the wetland connection from the otherwise jurisdictional water. And finally, the wetland, the rule provides that an adjacent wetland is jurisdictional in its entirety when a road or similar structure divides the wetland, as long as the structure allows for a direct hydrologic surface connection through or over that structure in a typical year. A direct hydrologic surface connection can be provided through a culvert or similar feature. It's important to note that the agencies have not modified their long-standing definition of wetlands. So before determining if a wetland meets one of the conditions of adjacency under the fauna rule, it yeah. must first meet the regulatory definition of a wetland. In other words, it has the appropriate hydrology, vegetation, and soil. The agencies have changed their test for determining whether wetland is adjacent compared to the 2019 rule. As noted earlier, the federal rule, it must first meet the regulatory definition of a wetland. In other words, as noted earlier, the fauna rule does not require a significant nexus analysis to determine adjacency of a wetland. The agencies also will no longer use the long-standing interpretation of neighboring, bordering, or contiguous, but rather a wetland must meet one of the four conditions in the final rule's definition and not be excluded under paragraph B of the final rule. Another key difference from the 2019 rule is that wetlands physically separated from jurisdictional water by an artificial feature where there is no direct hydrologic surface connection are not adjacent wetlands. Under the 2019 rule, wetlands may be found to be adjacent based on a subsurface connection. After considering public comments on the proposed rule, the agencies are not finalizing a separate category of jurisdictional ditches. Rather, ditches are jurisdictional where their traditional navigable waters are either constructed in or relocate a tributary or are constructed in an adjacent wetland and satisfy the flow conditions of the tributary definition, or are constructed in an adjacent wetland and develop wetland characteristics. For ditches constructed in an adjacent wetland, the agencies note that if a ditch then continues on through upland to flow into a jurisdictional water, that upland portion will still be jurisdictional so long as it has either intermittent or perennial surface water flow in a typical year. A key point is that the wetland has to meet the definition of adjacent wetland. All other ditches are excluded. This is also articulated in paragraph B of the final rule, which Stacy will discuss. The final rule provides greater clarity over the treatment of ditches compared to the 2019 rule by codifying which ditches are and are not jurisdictional. Overall, we expect fewer ditches will be jurisdictional compared to the 2019 rule. And as always, the burden of proof is on the agencies to determine if a ditch meets the conditions of the final rule to be jurisdictional. So as you've seen, typical year appears throughout the categories of jurisdictional waters. On this slide is the definition of typical year in our final rule. Typical year is a key concept for establishing jurisdiction based on surface water flow between a relatively permanent body of water, i.e. A, a perennial or intermittent surface water channel, a stand or standing body open water, and TNWs or territorial seas, and between wetlands and other jurisdictional waters. 
A typical year isn't necessarily describing a period of 365 days. It can be shorter or longer depending on the water resource of interest. Ultimately, the goal of this concept is to ensure that when a water is being evaluated, it isn't found to be jurisdictional because of unusually wet conditions or it isn't found non-jurisdictional because of unusually dry conditions. This is particularly important in distinguishing between ephemeral and intermittent streams and inundation by flooding. The agencies recognize the great variation across the country in precipitation and other climatic variables like evapotranspiration, length of seasons, and changing conditions over time. This concept allows for regionalization and variability within a national definition and helps determine what is essentially normal condition. The agencies will be relying on a rolling 30-year period of data for our evaluation. For example, when evaluating whether stream flows intermittently in a typical year, precipitation data from the current wet season could be compared to the range of precipitation that occurred during the past 30 wet seasons. We'll talk more about how the agencies will implement this concept and the other aspects of the rule a little later in the presentation. Now I'd like to turn the presentation over to Stacy Jensen with the Army. Thank you, Mindy. To complement the four categories of waters of the United States that Mindy just covered, the agencies are also covered by 12 exclusions from the definition and regulation under the Clean Water Act. Many of these waters and features are long-standing exclusions from the definition. The agencies attempted to balance a list of excluded features that are familiar, like waste treatment systems, without want, not wanting to include an exhaustive list that could create confusion if a feature is mistakenly not listed. Before I walk through each exclusion, there are a few key points that apply to many of them. Many of the exclusions refer to upland, which the agencies have defined in the final rule. In addition, the agencies are clarifying that where a feature is constructed or excavated in a non-jurisdictional water, as opposed to upland, it is excluded. So for example, an artificial pond constructed in a non-adjacent wetland is excluded. Where an exclusion is for a feature constructed or excavated in upland or in non-jurisdictional waters, the feature must be created wholly in upland or in non-jurisdictional waters. Features partially constructed in upland or in non-jurisdictional waters could potentially meet the definition of WOTUS. However, the mere interface between the excluded feature constructed wholly in upland and a WOTUS would not make that feature jurisdictional. For example, a non-jurisdictional ditch that connects to a tributary is not rendered jurisdictional just because it connects to it. As discussed earlier, there are certain excluded waters that can provide for a surface water connection between an upstream jurisdictional water and a downstream jurisdictional water in a typical year. The use of channelized in this context generally indicates features with a defined path or course, such as a ditch or the bed of an ephemeral stream. The flow must be channelized in the sense of being discrete and confined to a channel as opposed to diffuse, non-channelized flow. The first exclusion is intended to provide clarity. If a water is not covered under the four categories of jurisdictional waters we just discussed, then it is excluded from the definition. This is consistent with how we've implemented prior definitions of waters of the U.S. For the second exclusion, the agencies are clarifying that groundwater, including groundwater drain through subsurface drainage features, such as pile drains, is not a water of the United States. This is consistent with the long history of WOTUS, and the agencies have never interpreted the definition to include groundwater. We have created two different categories of excluded water features that are similar in order to distinguish between the kinds that may serve as a connection that maintains jurisdiction of upstream intermittent and perennial waters when the upstream waters are connected by channelized surface flow in a typical year to downstream jurisdictional waters, such as through ephemeral features, including ephemeral streams, whales, gullies, rills, and pools, non-channelized connections, such as diffuse stormwater runoff and directional sheet flow over uplands, however, do not serve as a connection that can maintain jurisdiction of upstream waters under the final rule. While neither of these types of features 
are wogus under the final rule, some ephemeral streams may be jurisdictional under the 2019 rule following a significant nexus analysis. However, features such as non-wetland swales and gullies and rills are generally not jurisdictional under the 2019 rule. Earlier in the presentation, Mindy spoke about ditches that are jurisdictional under the final rule. Here, the agencies are clearly articulating those ditches that are not jurisdictional, meaning those that are not CNWs or tributaries or do not meet the conditions of adjacent wetlands in certain circumstances. Types of ditches that are excluded under the final rule are those dug in upland, regardless of low classification, that form water distribution systems, roadside ditches, many agricultural ditches, and others that are part of industrial activities. Ditches that were constructed in features with ephemeral flow are also excluded. As the preamble notes, ditches that aren't quoted may function as conveyances of pollutants from point sources. The sixth exclusion is for prior converted cropland, which the agencies have excluded since 1993. However, for the first time, we are defining in regulation the conditions under which prior converted cropland will no longer be excluded under the Clean Water Act. The agencies anticipate more land retaining PCC designation under this final rule. In the past, the agencies have used two different approaches for making this determination. Either the land was abandoned or there was a change in use. In both circumstances, wetland characteristics had to return and the agencies would evaluate whether those wetlands met the definition of waters of the United States. In the final rule, we are only using abandonment. Under the final rule, PCC, which is determined by the USDA, is not considered abandoned if it's used for agricultural purposes at least once in the immediately preceding five years. The agencies are codifying additional exclusions generally consistent with longstanding practice, including artificially irrigated areas that would revert to upland should irrigation water cease, and water-filled depressions incidental to mining and construction activity as well as pits excavated in upland or non-jurisdictional waters for the purpose of obtaining fill, material, sand, or gravel. The exclusion for artificial lakes and ponds complements the lakes, ponds, and impoundments category and clarifies that an artificial lake or pond that meets the conditions of a jurisdictional impoundment is not excluded. All other lakes and ponds constructed or excavated in upland or non-jurisdictional waters are excluded. The agencies provide a few examples in the text of the regulation, but this is not intended to be an exhaustive list. One other point about this exclusion is that if there is a surface water connection between the artificial lake or pond, such as a non-jurisdictional ditch, the artificial lake or pond is still excluded. For example, off-channel reservoirs that are created in upland are non-jurisdictional. The agencies are also excluding from the definition of waters of the United States stormwater control features constructed or excavated in upland or non-jurisdictional waters. Where stormwater control features utilize rivers, streams, and channels that the tributary definition, they are not excluded. In addition, the agencies do not want to discourage or create disincentives to water reuse, groundwater recharge, or wastewater recycling systems. So exclusion B11 captures these structures where they are constructed or excavated in upland or non-jurisdictional waters. Finally, the agencies are retaining their long-standing exclusion for waste treatment systems and are providing clarity by defining what is included in these systems. The preamble to the final rule provides additional details and information on the various tools methods, data sets, and resources that may be used to inform determination. Although the sources of information mentioned in the preamble is not an exhaustive list, 
and the agencies will typically consider all relevant sources of information when evaluating jurisdiction. For the categories of jurisdictional waters, it is important to be able to determine whether they contribute surface water flow to a downstream TNW or territorial sea. There are various tools that can be used, including maps, aerial photography, and the U.S. Geological Survey's flow raindrop path in their stream stats application. I want to highlight how the agencies intend to implement some of the key aspects of the final rule. This is discussed further in the preamble. There are various existing tools used by the agencies currently that can assist in determining flow classification, including the NHD or local map, as well as other remote tools and data sets, such as aerial photographs, NRCS hydrologic tools and soil maps, NOAA snow maps, other desktop tools to estimate stream flow discharges, or modeling tools. Site visits may be needed sometimes when making determinations for tributaries, as well as for other categories of waters. The agencies currently use some existing rapid field-based stream flow duration assessment methods, or SDAM, developed by state and federal agencies that use physical and biological indicators to determine the flow duration class of a stream reach. And we'll continue to use these methods where they are available and whenever they are determined to be a reliable source of information for the specific water feature of interest. The agencies are currently working to develop regionally specific SDAMs for nationwide coverage, which will promote consistent implementation of the tributary definition across the United States. Additional information on the agency's efforts to develop regionally specific SAMs will be available on the EPA's website in the near future. As noted earlier in the presentation, applying a typical year concept ensures that the hydrologic flows and surface water connections, which are necessary to establish jurisdiction, are characterized based on normal climatic conditions, that is to say, that are characterized based on conditions that are neither too wet or too dry. Therefore, the evidence that is provided by various tools, methods, data sets, observations of flow, and other sources of information being used to evaluate surface flows and surface water connections should be interpreted within the context of the typical year concept. A variety of tools and data sets are available to ensure that the sources of information being used to evaluate surface flow and surface water connections are based on conditions that are neither too wet nor too dry. For example, the agencies have developed an antecedent precipitation tool, APT, that collects NOAA precipitation from nearby weather stations and compares precipitation from the time period of interest with precipitation data from the past 30 years. The agencies will generally use the APT to inform whether observations or other evidence of surface water flow occurred during times when precipitation conditions fall within the normal range of precipitation. However, there are other complementary tools and data sources that can be used to inform whether flows or surface water connections occur under normal climatic conditions. For example, drought indices, water budget models, snow telemetry data, continuous flow monitor data, physical and biological indicators of typical flow conditions, or remote sensing data and hydrologic models may be used to inform whether hydrologic flows or surface water connections occur in a typical year. As noted earlier, the agencies have not modified their longstanding definition of wetland. So prior to determining whether a wetland meets one of the conditions of adjacency under the final rule, it must first meet the regulatory definition of wetland. It has the appropriate hydrology, vegetation, and soil. The agencies will continue to use the existing tools and resources available to inform a wetland delineation. For example, the agencies may use a variety of remote tools and resources, such as state and local maps, aerial photography and satellite imagery, or U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's National Wetlands Inventory Maps as part of the process. The agencies will also continue to use existing resources, methods, and practices to verify the presence of wetlands and delineate wetland boundaries. For example, the agencies will continue to use the Corps' 1987 Wetland Delineation Manual 
as well as any other applicable resources for verifying the presence of a wetland and delineate wetland boundaries. These same tools may be used to inform a wetland jurisdictional determination as to whether they are adjacent. One of the ways that a wetland may be jurisdictional under the final rule is if it's physically separated from a paragraph A1 to 3 water only by a natural berm, bank, dune, or similar natural feature. These may, in certain instances, be identified through on-site observations or remotely using aerial photography and satellite imagery or other remote sensing information. Another way a wetland may be jurisdictional under the final rule is if it's physically separated from a paragraph A1 through 3 water only by an artificial dike, barrier, or similar artificial structure, so long as that structure allows for a direct hydrologic surface connection in a typical year through a culvert, flood or tide gate, pump, or similar artificial feature. The final rule clarifies that an adjacent wetland is jurisdictional in its entirety when a road or similar artificial structure divides the wetland, as long as that structure allows for the direct hydrologic surface connection through or over that structure in a typical year. Artificial structures that allow for those connections may, in certain instances, be identified through on-site observations or remotely using construction design plans, permitting data, state and local information, or levy or drainage district information. A lake, pond, or impoundment of a jurisdictional water may meet the definition of a water of the United States if it is inundated by flooding from a jurisdictional water in a typical year. Similarly, a wetland that is inundated by flooding from a jurisdictional water in a typical year is an adjacent wetland under the final rule. In order to determine whether a lake, pond, or impoundment, or a wetland is inundated by flooding in a typical year, the agencies may use a combination of remote tools and data sets, such as USGS screen gauge records, recurrence intervals of peak flows, wetland surface water level records, flood records, aerial photography and satellite imagery, or inundation modeling techniques and tools. One example of a site-specific modeling tool that could be used to evaluate inundation by flooding is the Corps' Hydrologic Engineering Center's River Analysis System, or HECRAS, software, which allows users to perform two-dimensional hydraulic calculations for natural and constructed channels and to perform inundation mapping and create inundation depth and floodplain boundary data sets. The agencies also recognize that site visits may be needed to perform on-site observations of hydrology or to observe the presence of field-based indicators of recent inundation. Such indicators may include the presence of watermarks, sediments and drift deposits, water stain leaves, or algal maps. As noted earlier, the agencies have developed an antecedent precipitation tool that may be used to inform determinations of whether surface flows or surface water connections occur in a typical year. A beta version of the APT tool will be made publicly available for download on the agency's website in the near future. Regionally specific SDAMs will be released over time as they are developed. As the agencies work to develop these methods, the agencies will ensure that input from stakeholders and the scientific community is considered as consistent with agency policies and will seek scientific peer review and provide, provide opportunities for the public to comment on the use of these methods before regional methods are finalized. Additional tools that would facilitate implementation may also be developed in the future. The agencies may develop new guidance or update existing guidance if and as necessary to facilitate implementation of the revised test for jurisdiction established by the final rule, both initially and as the agencies gain field experience to address implementation questions that may arise. Any such guidance will be developed in compliance with Executive Order 13891 and with any applicable public participation requirement. Thank you, Mindy and Stacy. And as the final slide shows here, 
for further information, we direct folks to visit the website shown on your screen uh, for more information about the final rule, including the pre-publication copy of that rule and preamble, supporting analyses, and fact sheets. In addition, you may direct questions to EPA at the address shown or to the core at the address shown. I want to thank everyone who took the time to listen to this webcast, and I want to apologize for the issue with the audio today, and I want to thank you for your patience. This concludes today's webcast.